All right. Uh, hello, everyone, and welcome to the civil seminar. Um, actually, this is our uh, 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 final last talk for uh, this uh, winter civil seminar series, and we have the great pleasure to have uh, Dr. Nusha Ajani with us. Um, um, and uh, just to give you a quick uh, background, Dr. Ajani is the director of uh, urban water policy uh, with Stanford University's Water in the West program. Um, prior to that, uh, Dr. Ajani was um, uh, this, a, uh, the senior research scholar at the Pacific Institute and served as a science and technology fellow at the California State uh, Senate's Natural Resources and Water Com Committee. Um, um, so Dr. Ajami received her uh, PhD in civil and environmental engineering from University of California in Irvine and her master's uh, from the University of Arizona and her bachelor's uh, uh, from Amicabi University of Technology in Tehran. Um, uh, her focus, uh, she's actually a leading expert in sustainable uh, water resource management in, in smart cities and water energy food nexus. And she uses uh, data science principles to study the human and policy dimensions of urban water and hydrologic systems. Uh, she has served in uh, prestigious committees in different roles. Uh, she was the uh, uh, gubernatorial appointee to the uh, Bay Area Regional Water Quality Control Board uh, for two terms and is currently a mayoral appointee to the San Francisco Public Utilities Commission. Uh, she has also served as a member of the National Academies Board on Water Science and Technology, as well as many other prestigious uh, roles in different committees and uh, yeah. Um, so with that said, it is really great uh, to have uh, Dr. Ajani with us. Um, and today she's gonna um, give a talk on the assessing the human and policy dimensions of water resource management by harnessing big data. Uh, thank you very much again and the stage is yours. Thank you so much, Dr. Najafi. I appreciate that. Uh, thank you for the invitation and welcome everyone. Uh, it's morning in California, so good morning and good afternoon to you. I am, uh, as Dr. Najafi mentioned, I'm going to talk a little bit about the, the how we use, my team uses data science to better understand uh, or better inform water resource management and uh, for the 21st century. Um, Let's see if I can make this thing work. Okay, so um, as many of you um, know, um, we, I mean, we live in a world that's defined by the 20th century infrastructure and, um, and we are still dealing with, uh, today we are dealing with a lot of 21st century challenges and needs. And um, the 20th century model that we had, so hold on, I'm gonna try to close this thing in front of me, okay. The 20th century centralized water infrastructure model that we built earlier in the 20th century uh, and uh, at the later uh, latter part of the 19th century was very much focused on large infrastructure, dams, um, aqueducts, and um, uh, major infrastructure that would bring water to us as a as a community. And most of it was once true system. So water comes to you. If you think about it, you use it it leaves your house or place of work, and then somebody else picks it up through another system of pipes and then clean it up and put it back in the environment. So it was a very much of a, that we call this a once true or sort of like a linear system. And also it was built based on abundance and hydrologic stationarity. And uh, maybe in Canada, abundance <clears throat> uh, might sound 
okay since you guys have a lot more water than we do but generally speaking abundance wherever you are is not necessarily a valid um, assumption uh, because there's always a limit to how much water we can take from the nature and also the hydrologic stationarity which means that we'll get the same amount of rain and snow uh, just a little bit up and down but the statistically is quite consistent a consistent is not necessarily holding anymore as we see a lot more extreme hydrologic events in the past uh, uh, 10, 20 years. Also, this was a top-down governance system, which mean, meant that the um, government would invest in these systems, then there were utilities that would um, be sort of a middleman and then provide the resources to you as an end user and we just paid our bills and never sort of got involved in the process of what do we need, what do we want. The challenge is this worked for a long time. It definitely enabled a lot of growth, social and economic growth in so many um, uh, so many countries in the US, especially in um, Canada, Western countries, every country that was able to kind of um, um, uh, put in place such an infrastructure system was able to um, uh, spur growth and um, uh, prosperity, obviously. Uh, however, the problem is um, this system doesn't necessarily hold anymore. We have about um, about four, um, uh, 4 billion people um, expected to be living in the cities by 2050. And, um, and uh, in this number is expected to even grow more by up to 70%. And um, the, uh, there are competing environmental needs. We have realized that that concept of abundance and we can take whatever we want out of the environment doesn't necessarily work very well because the environment starts dwindling and not necessarily so thriving under uh, the conditions we have set. And climate change is increasing probability of extreme events, floods, droughts, fires, and also uh, the infrastructure that we depend on are man-made. So very similar to the chair that you sit on or the building you depend on. Uh, these are, they all have life uh, expectancy and they, um, and a lot of the infrastructure we built in the 20th century are uh, sort of reaching the end of their design lifetime, which means they're um, aging and they're vulnerable and they're not as efficient as they used to be. And they, they are prone to be um, not functioning under various uh, social, environmental, or, um, or um, uh, economic stressors that we might have if we don't have money to invest in them, if there is a um, you know, flooding event that's happening. It, so many different things can uh, demonstrate the vulnerability of these systems. So these challenges that we are facing, obviously, it's, um, you know, this is very US centric, but um, it's, it's everywhere. It's not just California problem. It's, um, um, we, we have seen the day zero in Cape Town. You have uh, heard the different states are struggling uh, in California, in the US, just struggling with water use problems. My home country of Iran was having, uh, is having a lot of water issues and unfortunately California again after experiencing an unprecedented drought just recently uh, is uh, sort of um, going back to the drought again uh, which is uh, which is not really um, heartwarming and promising so how do we how can we transition in this 21st century infrastructure model what do we need to be doing to be able to build resiliency and be able to have sustainable water supplies that can enable our um, health of our communities and uh, help us to survive. Um, obviously, this, uh, there's a need to um, for us to be sort of enabling this paradigm shift, shift. We need to kind of have a fresh thinking. The model that we built this system based on in the 20th century obviously is not working. And we need to think, how do we need to revise that model in order for it to be um, sort of uh, more resilient and less vulnerable uh, under the existing stressors it's experiencing. The 20th century model that we had, as I said, it was a once true system and top down. There was another flaw in the system, which is actually, actually still going on. And um, we, we assume demand is always growing. As population grows, I'm sure a lot of you have heard, population growth means demand growth. And means that the more, um, as demand grows, we need to have more um, infrastructure. And if you assume there is a, a sort of, uh, 
perpetual increase in demand, you again start investing in large major infrastructure because you would like to be able to see these kind of infrastructures um, uh, fuel your economy and your community for years to come. So naturally, this would lead to making decisions about major large infrastructure. Um, however, in the water supply demand sort of equation process, uh, the, this is not necessarily how it should be working. Uh, as I said, the model that we have is problematic because it's, you know, if we continue building this way, because it's aging, it's, you know, it's a man-made infrastructure because of hydroclimatic limitations and also social preferences and environmental preferences, this kind of infrastructure is not going to last long and is going to cause more problem. Another piece of this is, uh, uh, you know, how uh, demand potentially can be uncertain. What we have seen over the years is demand is not perpetually increasing and it's actually, um, um, uh, you know, has its up and down for a while. It was increasing, but now we've seen so many different communities. It's on the, um, on the um, sort of declining or sort of steady state. Um, and, um, and that means that potentially we might not really need to have major, large centralized infrastructure to meet future demand. We might be able to do just a little thing on the margins or invest in a smaller infrastructure to meet this. So what I'm going to talk about today is going to sort of touch, touch on these two pieces. One is what is demand? How can we measure it? what's the, you know, if it's increasing, decreasing, what, how can we, how can we forecast it? And then the second piece would be, what's the best path forward if we want to build infrastructure to build resiliency for a future? And what form of an infrastructure does, do we need? And uh, what needs to happen? First, I'm gonna focus on the demand side piece because um, demand is a very important part of decision making when it comes to infrastructure and infrastructure planning and investment. Um, basically, demand forecasting is the foundation of water supply and infrastructure planning. And um, for decades, we have always been off in the way we predicted demand. As I said, there is this perception that population growth and demand growth have a direct relationship and um, they correlate directly. And as population grows, demand grows. So I give you a few examples to, to show you this is not holding really anymore. This is the water forecast, uh, the demand forecast for the city of Seattle. Uh, what you can see here is over the years, if you follow my cursor, you can see from the 1940s to about 1970s, demand was increasing over time. And then from the 1970s on, despite the fact that the city of Seattle has used multiple different models to predict where the demand is going to go in the next 20, 30 years, every time they have overestimated the demand or projected uh, over projected the demand and um, demand basically has been steady and actually declining over the years and has not been really following their demand projection so imagine if you are city of seattle and you are in the 1970s mark and you were expecting to get about 260 million gallon per day demand by by 1980s you needed a very, very different form of infrastructure compared to what you ended up with in that year, which was around 160, right? So 160 million, about 100 million gallons uh, per day off from what really happened. And this is not just the city of Seattle. You see the same sort of uh, over projections and under delivery for many other major cities in the US. You can see this is San Diego, very similar. You see Washington DC, very similar. You can see Phoenix, very similar. And something that I have to emphasize here, which you don't see in these figures is for all these individual cities that I am showing here, population almost has doubled for every single one of them. So they have their population doubled, but their water use hasn't changed, okay? Um, so 
Demand, so what, what we see here is water demand and population growth have sort of decoupled in recent years. And we can see that the water use is not as simply, it's not as simple as one would have thought in the, in the past that it's easily can be predicted using uh, simple um, demand, uh, population projections. Um, I actually spent a little bit yesterday, uh, couldn't find a lot of good data, and I, it's probably because I don't know where to get the data, uh, but I did try to find some data on Canada's water consumption in the past um, a number of years. The data I got was uh, uh, up to 2013, and what you see is a very similar sort of trend. Um, the, the increase from 2011 to 13 was mostly driven by the agriculture, uh, but this is basically total water use in consumption in Canada, and I'm happy to talk about consumption and use later if this is confusing to you. And you can see the household or urban water use has been declining over the years. So again, it's very similar when you think about Canada. As I said, water use is quite complex. Um, so many different factors are impacting it. Uh, generally, traditionally, everybody thought climatological uh, impact, if it's hot, if it's cold, if you have multiple seasons, if you're like living in the desert, that can impact your water use. Um, demographics, if you're wealthy, if you're poor, if you're uh, living in a, a you know, upscale um, part of the town, if you live on a more uh, you know, dense part of the town. Um, the, uh, uh, and another piece was, which is very, very commonly used to uh, deal with water use, was economics. As water rates increase, people use less water. As uh, pricing changes, people use less water. And these are some of the traditional um, but evolving water uh, um, factors that impact water use. But there's some emerging. Uh, factors also. Um, for example, uh, people respond to various behavioral campaigns. They do react to how media portrays the situation we are in. The structural changes, we have new infrastructure, we put smart meters now on uh, people's houses to measure their water use, or people use on-site reuse, which means recycled water in your building. So there are some, or you people may uh, you know, if they have outdoor water use, they may rip off their lawns and put different kind of landscaping so they can make structural changes. Also, there are piece, other pieces that are important. Water use is not only in the house, it's also outside. As I said, for example, not only your backyard, but also the malls and the uh, commercial buildings, or if you live in an apartment complex, the grass area in your apartment complex, these are all using a lot of water. So they do impact uh, knowing how they change their behavior is also important. So here I'm gonna, again, remember we are focusing on the demand side because we wanna know how demand is evolving. I'm gonna focus a little bit on a few of these pieces of emerging and understudied uh, water use patterns. And to do this, I'm going to use emerging data sets because some of these were enabled by having access for data, to data sets that we didn't have before. The first piece is the focusing on uh, public awareness and water use. Basically, public awareness and water use, I'm going to I'm going to focus on the Bay Area Water Supply and Conservation Agency for uh, to give you a sense. So um, this is the this is San Francisco, this area, this uh, uh, sort of the uh, orange area, San Francisco. And the area is basically this, this area, uh, which close around the Bay of San Francisco. And a lot, and all these people that you see here depend on an imported water the, and an infrastructure that was built about a century ago and brings the water from the Sierra Nevada to the Bay Area, to most of this community. Um, for this specific study, I am not looking at San Francisco. I'm looking at the at these other um, uh, orange areas that you see here, which is about 1.7 million residents, and they all depend on that water. Um, what you what we see here is water demand and population in the Bay Area has been evolved, have been sort of decoupling as well since the 80s. Water demand has not changed uh, as million gallon per day, and um, uh, population has grown about 30%. And this is, again, a little bit outdated, but I would say 
we still are expecting to for population of the Bay Area to grow and not or double in the next 20 years. And there's still an expectation that water demand would grow. Um, and uh, you see some of the projections here, not as dramatic as you saw in the other figures that I showed, but there's still an upward projection of how water use is going to change. Um, what we saw recently in California, which you might have seen in the newspaper or have heard in the news, we just recently came out in 2016, came out of, came out of an unprecedented drought. Um, it, was, it was quite severe, uh, especially hydro, I mean, it was hydrologically uh, severe. And one thing that was very important about this specific drought was it was very, very hot and temperature was very high. Um, so it wasn't just because we were not getting enough precipitation, we were also experiencing hot, hot temperatures. And this drought lasted for about four years um, and, um, and it, it had a significant impact in the, in, um, in the way we use water in California. One thing that was very interesting about this drought also was um, there was a significant media coverage on this drought. The governor of California, who uh, Governor Brown was um, uh, quite, is a, uh, he's, a, he's not a governor anymore, but he's a very uh, media savvy person. So from the beginning of the drought, he actually used his political position and, uh, and uh, the importance of engaging with media as a way of increasing public awareness. So he actually um, went to the mountains when we measured the snow every year and he actually measured, there was like no snow. And he actually went and took a stick and said, look, I'm here to measure snow and there's no snow, look, there's no snow. So people look, we are in a drought, please pay attention. So he actually created this media frenzy around the drought in California and media actually paid a lot of attention to it, not just California, but actually um, across the nation and globally, we got a lot of coverage on the situation in California's drought. We were very interested to see how water use, how me that media coverage impacted water use. There were a couple of things to pay attention to. One, there was a recent drought that we came out of 2007 and nine. Um, the, uh, the governor at the time did declare drought emergency, um, uh, Governor uh, Schwarzenegger. Uh, that was during our uh, economic downturn and also uh, the uh, um, uh, election of President Obama, which was quite historical. And there was a lot of focus on those issues. Nobody cared about California drought. We did not get at all any coverage on California drought. Before I get into that, I actually should mention something else. We were interested in this media coverage. There, there are a few places you can get that data. We weren't really happy with the data. You can get it from LexisNexis um, and, um, and um, some of the other websites or um, um, news archive um, places, but we actually developed our own um, scraping uh, algorithm, it's called Articulate. And we use that, we sort of overlaid that on top, top of, top of uh, Google API. And um, we basically, what we saw is, um, we basically use that uh, to collect data on how much media coverage drought in California has received. So we used, uh, for that specific search, we used Articulate to scrape uh, the web for nine different medias, and all of them were highly, we, we chose nine uh, highly circulated media outlets in the US, um, including, and some of them were overlapping. So think about New York Times, Wall Street Journal, Washington Post, um, uh, San Francisco Chronicle, uh, San Jose Mercury, LA Times, Orange County, um, um, uh, USA Today. So it's like there was nine, there were nine of them. And we scraped the web for all of them and see how many times the word drought, the word um, flood, uh, sorry, uh, storm, the word conservate, water conservation, like we had search terms that we put in there and uh, sort of collected that data. So what you see here in this black line is actually what um, the, art, the, out, the its output of articulate. Okay, 
So what you see here is, and then the bars shows you the, um, the monthly Palmer drought severity index, which is red, when it's red, which means we are in drought, when it's blue, means we are not in a drought. So you can see this is the first drought I mentioned, not much of media coverage, a little bit, not much, but as we went into the drought in California, the coverage increased. You see that I stopped this, we stopped this in 2015, and there was a reason for it, because in 2015, the governor basically, uh, before he asked people to voluntarily change their water use. By the time we hit the 2015, um, he basically came out and said, hey, we are in a severe drought, we have to stop using water. So there was a mandatory water use restrictions put in place. So for that, we basically, we wanted to uh, make sure that the, our data doesn't get um, uh, sort of um, impacted by the mandatory requirements that were put in place. The second thing is we also looked at how people search the internet for droughts. So the same time, so what you see here is that the blue is the Google searches that people have done. So you can go and find people if people have searched a specific term in the, your region. So this is in the Bay Area and the blue line here shows the number of times people search for the same search terms that we use for articulate in the Bay Area. And you see the black is actually what the articulate num, which is the number of articles that we covered. And we sort of normalize them to be able to capture them. And there's a 90% correlation between the two. Um, so, so you see that there is like a very significant correlation between people paying attention as media coverage increases. So just close this specific part of this uh, study, what we did was we modeled water use and we looked at the conventional um, things that impact water use, temperature, precipitation, uh, drought uh, index, price of water on, uh, and uh, household income and, um, and unemployment. Uh, in the one that you see, so the actual water use is those, um, the blue or purple dots. And the red is the one that's modeled, uh, including the media, number of media articles. And the green is the one without the media articles. And what you see here is, and this is very zoomed in, so um, uh, don't mind you, but you can see that actually, especially during this period, if we do not incorporate media coverage, uh, which is the one, um, which is the green one, um, the, because the, you know, we were coming out of the recession, the unemployment was very low, the income was increasing, there was an expectation that water use would be, continue to increase. But what you see here is it's going downhill. And as soon as we inc included the news article uh, as, a, as a, a variable in our model, we can see there is the, the nicely sort of captures the signal that we see in the actual data, uh, which shows that media had a significant impact and public awareness had a significant impact in water use behavior. So just to give you a sense, about 100 droughts related articles uh, in a bi-monthly period was associated with decrease in a single family residential water use per capita of 11 to 18 uh, percent. And I should also emphasize this was only for single family residentials. We did not look at other uh, other forms. However, um, as I mentioned, large landscapes and outdoor irrigation is also very, very important for some of these regions, including California. And in California specifically, about half of our water is used outdoors. These two green areas are showing the water use in the outdoor spaces. And um, it's not just California. This is the map of all the grass areas in the US. And uh, in a recent study, um, uh, they, they found that uh, we, in the US, we use more water for, I mean, the, more water for uh, grass than uh, seven other crops that we actually depend on. We use more, we, use, we grow more grass than corn, uh, which is the highest um, um, uh, agricultural production in the US. So we actually grow more grass, um, uh, it's uh, lawns and grass in the US, which we don't neither eat it nor need it, um, but we spend a lot of water and resources on it. And um, just to look at the large landscape irrigation, which is the amount of water that's used for, as I said, outdoor malls, uh, commercial buildings, 
um, you know, homeowner associations, the buildings that have, you know, outdoor grass that's taken care of by others. And then that sort of adds up about to about 0.9 million acre feet of water uh, per year. And that's, that can provide water for about 2 million households. So it's a lot of water. Um, so we were also interested to see this public awareness impacted the behavior of these groups. Um, uh, we wanted, uh, we looked at a city called Redwood City, they have smart meters, another uh, emerging data set. And we, we wanted to do this in a form, um, there was a natural study set up for us there. We didn't set it up, they set it up themselves, we used it as a natural experiment. Um, they have outdoor irrigation, uh, for these commercial and uh, homeowner association groups. Some of them receive water from the city as a tap water, some receive it as a recycled water. And basically the way it works is um, you will have a natural process to see people who have recycled water and people who have tap water, how do they change their water use in outdoor spaces, especially in this specific case, people who were using portable water they're subject to fines and um, um, if they were using a lot of water outdoors. However, people who were using recycled water had no restrictions whatsoever. They were actually encouraged to use more water because um, uh, it's, you know, it's first of all, there's a, um, a recycling plant there that has built, been built and uh, they would like people to use it because they have to recover the cost of operating that system. And also recycled water is sort of it's, it's a closed loop, so they were thinking it's okay um, to encourage that. However, what we found was, um, so what you see here, the blue is the people who were using portable water, and purple is the people who were using recycled water. And what you see here is, um, uh, and z below 0% means people are conserving. So the the bigger the negative number, the more those people are conserving. And what you see here, is that um, obviously portable water users were under restrictions, they were supposed to conserve and they definitely did deliver over the years from 2014 to 16. What you see here is recycled water users, even though they were not required to save, they still save. Not in the same level as the portable water users, but they still save. And we believe most of, and they were actually, as I said, they were also encouraged to use water, not conserve. So we believe this was actually related to the public awareness and also another item, which is the neighborhood norms. People learn from each other. If your neighbor sort of starts doing certain things, you may pay attention. There is also sort of like a, a neighborhood pressure. If you're in a drought, why aren't you watering? Um, so what we see here, is that this area is very residential, lots of um, uh, single family homes, or uh, sorry, this is not single, lots of parks, and they all depend on uh, portable water. This area is a newer part of the town of Redwood City, and they have a lot of recycled water, as, as you see, the purple dots are recycled water. And those dots that you see, the red and blue dots that you see, basically are showing hot spots. What we see is it's good to have both of them. Just what, when it's red, the conservation level was much more significant compared to blue, but they're both saving. And what you see here, as the drought progresses and the severity of it increases, and there's increased public awareness that we are in a severe drought, you see that the number, the neighborhood sort of conservation grows, the neighborhood norm grows, and so as the um, so as the uh, conservation level that we see in the uh, portable water users, which they had to conserve. So you can see that the recycled water users, even though if they did not need to, because they were mixed with some of these uh, portable water users, they sort of paid attention to your, their surrounding and they saw people changing their behavior. So they did the same thing. Just to wrap up this, uh, I have one last piece that I wanna talk about. We talked about demand and how it's not on this ever increasing trajectory that water utilities think. Now, the question is how that can actually translate into the way we decide about water supply. 
And um, basically, does that impact the way we do infrastructure planning? Does that the way impact the way we um, build infrastructure? So in this part, I'm going to talk a little bit about water supply diversification and how uh, it needs to be approached. So as we talked about this, um, the 21st century uh, water infrastructure model will be very different. They will focus on conservation and efficiency, potentially direct portable reuse, green infrastructure, a lot of different things. We are going to move away from this uh, once true system and build more of a sort of circular economy around water. And as we are building this, we have to understand how are we doing this and how we need to manage this transition. Um, to give you a little bit of a sense, think about it as solar panels on people's roofs, okay, and solar farms and wind panel, uh, wind um, turbines, and there are small ones and build big ones. There's so many different ways we are diversifying our energy portfolio, and that, if it's not done strategically, can actually impact the way our infrastructure functions. So. Um, uh, diversification of water supply for portfolio really can help to uh, build resiliency and reliability and flexibility. As I said, very similar to energy sector, it's easier said than done. Um, you can see that uh, um, uh, there are some physical, socioeconomical, institutional uh, challenges. It's not cheap. Um, so uh, one thing that I'm going to focus on here is if we all depend on one source of one resource together, if we all depend on a well that we all have together, if I say water, there's more water left for you. If I build, um, you know, if I build a recycling plant on my land, there'll be more water left for you or for a new person who's coming in or for somebody who really doesn't have the capacity to save. So the idea here is, can we collectively work together to build this kind of infrastructure rather than constantly building from top down? Can we focus on local opportunities, local uh, capacity to build this kind of infrastructure model we need for the 21st century? For this study, we focused on Sonoma County Water Agency. And um, as I said, the idea is sort of creating some sort of like a goal-based trading or a cap and trade for water. So, um, uh, and you might have heard of this, we have done this with um, carbon emissions, we are doing it in energy, um, a renewable energy portfolio, water quality, so many different ways. To provide you a simple platform, how it works, as I said, to imagine two cities, both depend on a common pool of water, a well, a river, a reservoir. Uh, if, if there is a, a requirement that they have to diversify their water supply, 25% of their water needs to come from somewhere else than this common pool of water. And that 25% would translate to three drops of water for each one. You might have city A, that actually has a lot of capacity to diversify. They can fix their leaks, they can build gray water systems, they can put green infrastructure, they can build a recycling plant. And there's city B that basically really doesn't have that much capacity. They either don't have the resources or the capacity to build more. They can only do a little bit of recycling and some gray infrastructure, green infrastructure. However, if you create a uh, trading platform, um, as these people, as the city builds this extra drop of water, that drop of water can go to this common pool and they can receive a subsidy to invest in this uh, infrastructure that they have. At the same time, because city B cannot or don't have the capacity to invest in everything that they need to meet the 25% requirement, they actually um, can buy that credit by paying to the bank, that way that amount of money can go back to subsidize other people's research, other people's investments. So it's kind of collectively, we are investing in a distributed system that we all depend on as we are meeting our regional goals. Um, for Sonoma County Water Agency, there are like nine water agencies. I'm only showing here eight. Um, I don't expect you to read through these graphs, but one thing I want you to notice is the red, red line is where the 25% uh, um, diversification line falls. If these cities individually needs to reach their uh, uh, diversification goal, some can easily reach it, some will have a hard time reaching it. As you can see, city B, city F, and city G 
and C are barely can make it halfway through the diversification goal that they have. So not every, not every one of them is the same, but some of them have more capacity. So the idea is if you put them all together, potentially they can reach that 25% easier, faster, potentially cheaper. Um, the question is, can this really help uh, them reach that 25% collectively as a community? And what you see here is if we set um, a diversification goal for this whole community without telling them they can trade or work together, they as a collective, as a region, they cannot reach that 25%. So this is the 25% diversification goal by 2040. They cannot reach that goal and also it would cost them a lot more to reach that and not even reach it. They can spend a lot of money, not even reach the amount of water they can, uh, they can generate through diversification. The next group is uh, the ones that they can actually trade. They can work together collectively and trade. And what you see here, they do in 20 years reach their 25% diversification goal. They actually reach it with a, you know, on a lower cost. Um, so it can create more flexibility um, when you are allowing them to trade. And so um, and uh, they can reach it in a costlier and a con more economic way. The second question is, if they don't, if they trade, but they don't talk to each other, if I go build my own diverse, my own uh, uh, infrastructure, you build your own infrastructure, and the goal is at the end of the day, I'm hoping to sell mine to you, you are hoping to sell yours to me, there would be no market really, they're not going to be a lot, there will be overflowing the system without in a, in a specifically anybody wanting anything from the system. So what you see in this in this graph on the left is they're doing independent tra trading. They are, uh, they are over investing uh, in, in uh, diversification and they will have extra uh, capacity and their cost is gonna be much more significant. Again, if they work together, they trade they, uh, and if they coordinate, they can ap approach that 25% cheaper, faster, easier without necessarily generating a lot of over capacity. So just wrapping this up, um, I um, talked to you, uh, just give you, gave you two perspectives on how we need to move to a 21st century infrastructure uh, model that we need by uh, sort of embracing diversification and collaboration and coordination also gave you a perspective of the importance of demand in this process, because if I think demand is going forever and ever based on population growth, potentially those marginal investments that I can make for a small infrastructure are not going to be uh, enough. So, um, so the idea is as we get more data and more information, as we understand the system better, as we have more uh, tools that collect more information for us from internet to smart meters to actually smart cities that can track drops of water, where they come, where they go, how they come. Um, you know, the platform I just told you for cap and trade, it, it is a very data driven system because if you don't really understand, if you can't track what comes in, what goes out, it's gonna be very hard to make it efficient. It is very important to kind of move away from this supply side management approach that we have focus on the demand side management, and then harness some of these unconventional data sources to kind of see what's the role of human being, what's the role of policy making, how can they inform a more sustainable and optimal way of investing in infrastructure rather than, again, over investing on solutions that we don't need or they're not uh, in the long run resilient and sustainable. And with that, I wanna acknowledge um, all the people who have worked with me and the projects I presented here to you and uh, funding that we received and, and with that, any questions you have, I'm happy to answer. Thank you very much, Nusha. It was a very fascinating uh, presentation. I really enjoyed that. And I'm sure everybody did. Um, so um, yeah, if you have uh, any questions, you can uh, just go ahead and unmute yourself uh, and ask or use the chat window. Uh, in the meantime, uh, I will start with, with my question. Um, so you, sh you showed um, 
um, your study on the correlation between um, the media coverage and the draft and the demand. Um, and in a previous uh, slide, you also showed the uh, media coverage uh, graph uh, for the uh, two governor periods, you know, Arnold and, and Jerry Brown. Right. Uh, so you did this analysis for the recent period and that showed a close correlation. I was wondering if you also did such analysis for the the, the other drought period. The yeah, yeah, it was here. Sorry, I should have said that. So I apologize. So if if I um, I should have mentioned. So this this period is the other droughts. Uh -huh. Okay, and what you see here is actually um, the the trend sort of better covered when you actually do include media for this one as well. Mm -hmm. But what you see is um, uh, the water use is sort of precipitously dropping. Uh, as, as I said, this period from here on, it's we were in deep um, recession uh, because of the economic downturn. So it was very fast dropping and unemployment was actually decrease, uh, increasing as well. But still, the one with the media is doing a better job of capturing this, but not as well as you would have expected it, just because it wasn't as much of a media coverage. But it's definitely correcting the trend, as you can see. Yeah, 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 yeah. It's quite interesting. And um, so, um, related to the uh, diversification, um, right. uh, I'm not sure, but uh, maybe I'm wrong. But I, I assume that you know, the system in the U.S. is uh, has uh, lots of rules and lo lots of lots rules. of rules. Yes, and there are different counties and different uh, states, etc. They have to uh, you know uh, communicate with each other. Um, so um, this trading uh, does it only work for the U.S. or do you think it also works for other? Um, countries that have their national uh, national kind of water control. And which one right. do you think is better? Okay, so um, to th those are both great questions. So first thing is the, um, this would work if, so you have to build it bottom up, right? So it cannot be top down. So meaning that you have to start from communities that depend on one source of water. For example, the area I showed, they depend on Hetch Hetchy right? Or Sonoma, we talked about, they depend on Russian River. So that way, you're not dealing with water rights issues, which I think we were sort of touching on as well. So when you leave water in a system, there is this sort of way of making sure the water is used in other ways or goes to other people, right? So you're not dealing with use it or lose it. Mm -hmm. um, I think, um, uh, you know, it would be good to have a na stronger national uh, water um, directorate, just because um, if you don't have a state, for example, like California, that um, that makes environmental regulations and access a priority, you may end up in really dire situations. Um, and that's what you see in the US, because depending on state to state you go, um, because we don't have a very strong national directorate for water, you end up, you know, in different situations. Um, for um, the trading platform, potentially, then you can actually scale it up and reach to a state or watershed level. But that means that you need to have all those bottom pieces in place. And the idea with that is that you're not moving water around at all, right? So basically, you are just trading credits. So you're leaving the water in the system in that way. I hope I answered your question. Sure, thank you. Um, so a question from Vinay. Thank you very much for the interesting presentation. Uh, question about water systems. You mentioned about how building our infrastructure has an influence on our water systems. What needs to be done to change the way we build our urban cities, towns and suburbs in order to produce a sustainable water economy? Right, so I think that's a great question. Um, the, the, the reality is we have to build circular systems, right? That are much more efficient. Uh, they use water, we should use water as many. For, okay, so this, this is my sort of list. 
we should use as least amount of water as we can. And then from then on, every drop of water that we use, we should be able to recycle it as many times as we can. Um, so this con that way we don't impact the environment as much because every drop of water you use is degraded in many ways. So it, has to, it requires resources and energy and um, other material to be cleaned up and put back in the environment. So it is very, very important to be able to do that. And then the future cities are going to have that kind of a um, sort of a diverse water supply portfolio, similar to what you see with energy that sort of feed into each other, talk to each other and um, you know, buildings with uh, their own recycling plants, buildings is much more efficient appliances and um, fixtures and also uh, cities that basically capture every drop of rain and um, uh, storm as they can and reuse it and reuse it. Um, so basically trying to become the most efficient as you can within the city and we need smart systems and data to be able to do that. Uh, related to this, if, if you can also uh, find it Bring back yes, close the that. Slide, yeah. The last slide that you Last slide. The, okay. Uh, sure. Focusing on the demand versus the water supply management. Right. Uh, so uh, assume that uh, you are in charge of uh, you're basically the president, I don't know, the, the country that uh, you have the option to, uh, to, uh, to build a desalination plant, you know. In many countries, they have oil. You know, they sell the oil, etc. And um, so that that gives you a lot of attention from the public, and you have uh, added to the supply. And uh, I think the media, the public generally buys that much. On the other side, uh, the other option is to go through this diversification portfolio, very complex, and you have to manage things and maybe. Um, something in the middle fails, there are some complexities. Um, so the question is, what is it that should motivate uh, these uh, decision makers to, to adopt this, this approach? And why do you think in California they have already adopted this approach? What is it that in, uh, kind of motivated them? Yeah, so, uh, so a couple of things, uh, great question. Uh, it's it's much more attractive for uh, policymakers to cut red ribbons, and uh, the bigger the infrastructure, the better, the more attractive. And uh, you know, and I think desalination plant has been very popular because people think it's a, a sort of drought um, a resistant uh, or resilient solution. Which it sort of is true, but not necessarily because you're not necessarily helping the process. There's a lot of environmental impact. The brine is, is an issue to deal with. We have we use a lot of energy. We don't generate as much water as we should as we are desalinating. Countries like, um, for example, Israel that you see use a lot of desalination, desalinated water, they have already done tons to make sure their system is efficient. I'm sure they can do even more, but actually they're the best example of, they have done tons of demand side management. They're mm -hmm. recycling every drop of water and they still don't have enough, so they have to go there, right? And then you have countries like, uh, uh, you know, the, some of the countries in the uh, uh, Persian Gulf uh, that actually do, do have had desalination plants for a long time, but actually uh, I've worked with Abu Dhabi a little bit and, uh, and the Emirates generally. And what you see is demand management is not at the, on the table as much. They're not necessarily that eager to, um, to help people to use less water, but they, they're much more, they have much more of a supply side attitude in place. And they actually see more desalination can help them to kind of place themselves into the technological path that they hope to be. Um, so California is actually is an interesting example because <laughs> there's always a conversation about desalination. We don't build it. We have built one, one already. We have a few small ones, um, but it's very difficult to build desalination plants here just because environmentally is not very positive and there's so much inefficiency in the system. Um, I would say, um, uh, you know, there, it, California has been in, in and out of droughts and in and out of stressors and um, uh, for so long and actually has very active 
uh, nonprofit community that's sort of constantly hitting on this issue and not necessarily letting it go. Um, so there's a little bit more leniency toward in, sort of paying attention to this. Having said that, in my current position um, uh, on the San Francisco Public Utilities Commission, I'm constantly observing how difficult it is to switch the conversation from supply side, building re re uh, reliability by building more infrastructure and switching it to focusing on demand, just because it's very hard for water utilities to think about it this way. One last piece to this also is that the way we have our water utilities built, they are very much, most of them make money as they sell water. And most of them are in the business of building more supply to sell more water. They're not in the business of maintaining demand that much. Um, so it's very hard for them when people start using less water, that means they're making less money. Um, and they're all nonprofit, they're all municipal water, most of them are municipal water utilities, but when they don't make enough money, they have, then that impacts the amount of resources they have that they can invest in future infrastructure. So it's a complex process and I would say it has all these different layers to it. Certainly very complex. Maybe we need more media coverage for that. We need more media coverage for that, there you go. <laughs> But you know, it's real because honestly, one, one thing I didn't mention was the, that project was motivated with the media project was motivated because a few of my very close friends who are running water agencies here, they would call me and they're like, can you guys do some form of a survey or something and see why people are not using water? Because we haven't done anything. We haven't changed our conservation plan. We are not doing additional public awareness campaigns. We are not promoting conservation. And people are saving. And we don't know what it is. And we want to know what is it that they're doing. And uh, that's how we sort of like, oh, it might be media. It should be media. So that's how actually we started doing that project. And we have tested it on a few other regions as well. And the same, you see the same thing all in California, because that's what that, that whole policy paradigm was happening here. Well, I think, yeah, as, as you mentioned, the, uh, the amount of com coverage and the emphasis from the, uh, uh, that, uh, the governor at that time, it really, it not only influenced people in, in the US, but also, you know, we kept he hearing about that outside the US as well. Absolutely. Absolutely. It was, you know, it was a period of calm in the U.S. Obviously, it was 2012. We were, um, you know, we had a president that uh, paid attention, was doing his own thing. It wasn't like a chaos uh, that we experienced later. <laughs> so, so media just had nothing else to cover by California's drought. So it was a popular topic. Yeah. Um, yeah. So, um, so it got a lot of coverage for sure. That's right. All right, we ran out of time. Um, uh, thank you very much again. And yeah, thank you. The, uh, uh, interesting and eye-opening talk. I hope we can have you again in our future seminar. Uh, it's a, it's a uh, term-based seminar series in the fall and winter. So I hope we can make it uh, maybe in person that time. Hopefully, um, yes, that would be lovely. Yeah. Thank you for having me. I really appreciate that. Any questions, everybody, feel free to email me my email. Uh, is here and uh, I appreciated the questions and your attendance. That was lovely. Excellent. Thank you. Thank you so Have a much. Great day. You too. Bye bye. Bye everyone. Thanks. Bye bye. Bye everyone.